I warn you, Rome is an affront to God. Rome is strangling my people and my country, the whole earth. But not forever. I tell you, the day Rome falls, there will be a shout of freedom such as the world has never heard before. This is Criteria. Hey everybody, just wanted to give you a quick heads up as to what you can expect from this episode of Criteria. Unfortunately, while recording, we had some production uh, technical difficulties and uh, so the video ended up being unusable. However, the audio is fine. So what I'm going to give you, instead of you seeing us talking about Ben-Hur, you're going to hear us talking accompanied by clips, images from the film, production stills and things like that. And I hope that'll be good enough for you until we get back to our normal production routine in the next episode. Thanks and enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Criteria, continuing our discussion of the Vatican film list uh, with a film on the religion category, a classic Hollywood epic called Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, directed by William Wyler, based on a novel by General Lou Wallace, very popular novel in its time. And uh, we have a great guest with us to discuss this film. Uh, she's been recently a guest on the Catholic Culture Podcast, my interview show, where we talked about uh, the theme of the temptation of St. Anthony through art history. We did a very long episode, great episode on that. And uh, she's an art historian, the author of a recent book from Sophia Institute Press, titled How Catholic Art Saved the Faith. Her name is Elizabeth Lev, and uh, she's an especially appropriate guest on this film, a film about ancient Rome, because she lives in Rome and uh, has, uh, in better times, given tours of Rome. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you for uh, coming on this other podcast. Well, thank you for having me again and to talk about such a fun subject. Yeah, so I'm kind of interested in... Uh, the topic. Oh, hi, James, by the way. I hey, forgot Thomas. to introduce my co-host. Uh, you didn't <laughs> even introduce yourself. I didn't introduce myself. I'm here I'm, sitting with Thomas Mears. Yes, this is uh, right. your co-host, James Majewski. We were a little, had a lot of technical difficulties. Oh my gosh, uh, we had technical this difficulties which, of just which, titanic which, scale. Yeah, which, just like this film, yes. Uh, <laughs> which, which left me a little frazzled as I was starting, so I wasn't quite as recollected. I was wondering about your 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 viewing of this film because you know you're very knowledgeable about Rome small portions of this film take place in Rome and you know all of it takes con takes place in the wider context of the the Roman Empire you know during Christ's life do you have uh, a a strong opinion on the accuracy of this film oh dear I, I don't think I watched the, the movie for uh accuracy um i don't think that <laughs> that really is it's kind of like I, I don't really question the time travel question in the avengers it's just it's it's just i drink in this vision and also i think it's fair to say that the film doesn't really take place in rome except for a time the the the, the time that ben hur is in rome is so small that we don't really need to worry about oh is that what a roman house looked like what i did notice was the amount of research mm -hmm. they did do to put in um, as many little details so you'd be looking at a floor and going, oh yeah, I think I recognize that mosaic floor. So you see these people who really took a lot from looking around the city. The amount of research that these people did to make this film was, was epic in and of itself. Well, you know, uh, I noticed one particular detail from my travels in Italy, which was the tile floor uh, in the scene where the the Romans are all getting massages, uh, I it reminded me of something that I saw in uh, Ercolano, I guess it's called in Italian, but the Herculaneum. Uh, when I went there, uh, that being the one kind of real ruin uh, uh, from from the volcanic eruption that I visited, 
and that was quite well preserved and it looked looked very very similar it looked very inspired from roman bathhouses yes it was it was very very fun i mean it 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 uh maybe the costumes of the women were a little bit too uh they were awfully well fitted for the day but uh, i found that <laughs> i found the details they added were great fun and their attention to the curuses and and the the work on the chariots of course is really quite remarkable so um it was it's 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 what the what the italians would call an americanata where inspired from uh taking bits and pieces of italian culture and decoration but turning it into a big old hollywood set i think that there's something to be said for that too what what did you say that the term was americanata, americanata? We're not we're not interested in every day what what life looks like every day. Charlton Heston right. is improbably fan. They both both Nassau and Charlton are they're improbably fantastic looking. They are just right. everybody looks beautiful. The, everything is over the top. The stadium is ridiculously large. It's all of that is what people associate. I mean, they associate uh, uh, that that kind of extravagant. Uh, 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 joyous boisterousness of, of with with America, and I think it's really one. Yeah. Of the, it's our best foot forward. Like why why try to pretend we like little little? Why, why try to make it look gritty and small when we can make it grand and glamorous? <laughs> I think that's an, an incredible point because you know nowadays there would be a lot of people who would who would question that kind of a portrayal um, as sort of you know. Uh, misunderstanding or misrepresenting a culture. Um, you might get ac accused of fetishizing a culture. Um, but but I think that when you, especially when you look at some classic films and not so much the accurate portrayal of a culture as the sort of romanticized or or passed through, filtered through the lens of an outside culture's perspective on a culture, I think that that's really interesting to see in film, whether it's ancient Rome, or I think you see this a lot with uh, the Far East or Oriental uh, civilizations. You know, obviously there are some problematic depictions that are bound up with that too, but some of them are really fantastic and, uh, and exotic and um, exciting to see in a film where this isn't the real world. This is a a fan, almost a fantasy. It is a fictive world that we're creating. And like you said, to just drink it in, that was obviously something that uh, that I I was I found myself doing on both viewings of Ben Hur in preparation for this uh, episode. Um, and I think is probably the reason why it's included on so many best of lists. You, you know including the Vatican film list, the realization of this world is in, in vibrant technicolor and these incredible set pieces and costuming and design. It's just so wonderfully realized, if not necessarily historically accurate. No, I think I mean, it's, first of all, I think people who uh, get worked up about, oh, this isn't the correct portrayal of this or that, or I find that the, I suppose today people were, I was watching it with the eye of like, what would people think in 2021? Oh my gosh, why is that chic wearing brown face? I mean, if you're doing that, then you just are not a <laughs> fun people. It's a fun movie. Let it go. Enjoy yourself. Let them, I mean, think about what it was like when this movie to be shot for, this is five of these super 65 millimeter ca cameras nothing like it. It's never been done before. So you have this super ambitious filming, you have angles. So you have a God's eye view. You have, you know, as if you're sitting in front of the chariot, the next second, it, you are completely immersed in this world. It was so new and so exciting. And so it, you, you, it, we are so used to the CGI effects that we're kind of like, oh yeah, well, that's cute. Hey, and you know what? Their effects, by the way, hold up pretty well in 2021, but we're so used to being being blown away by huge screens and large large filming that we have to kind of remember what I, I wish I had been there the first time that they came up like the first time I saw Star Wars like that same feeling people must have had when they when they saw Ben Hur for the first time mm. in theaters. Well, you know, I think that the excitement, the exhilaration of this film uh, still totally translates um, even in our day of sort of this glut of CGI special effects and fantastic feats on film. Um, I'm thinking of two s scenes in particular. First, the the naval battle uh, between the Roman 
fleet and the Macedonians, and then obviously second, the chariot race. Both of those were just so thrilling to watch. And um, and maybe not having all of the sort of bells and whistles that you might associate with uh, a modern day uh, action film. I'm, I'm thinking in this instance, particularly of the, the sea, the naval battle, but but still amazingly executed and the logistics of which are are like boggling to 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 consider especially the chariot race sequence i mean that i think any film studio would be hard pressed to replicate something like that today um i mean when we were watching it we made the comparison to the uh how the rohirrim are handled in the lord of the rings trilogy and you don't see anything that captures quite the the power of of a stampeding horse, you know, or or the the cringe that's induced when you see a person get trampled. Um and 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 that's, you know, using all of the latest technology and and decades later. This I watching it even when I knew what was going to come, I still found myself sort of at the edge of my seat and 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 cringing um yeah. during some of those more high intense moments during the chariot yeah, race. Yeah, it's not only the details like that, but also just yeah, the the set itself, the size of that set, that that particular the circus was the biggest movie set ever built at oh, that time. Wow. Um so uh, yeah, I mean it, the whole thing is just huge and real. Mm. Um that's that incredible statue they have in the in the middle and and makes as you described it Elizabeth that those god's eye shots it makes generous use of those in setting up there, there's quite a lot of time just spent setting up that set actually mm. before the race even starts right. just having the horses sort of trot around the track a couple times <laughs> uh just so we can take a good look at that set and the the spectators and everything yeah. else um by the way there is one note of realism in this film which is that there's a, a dis- decidedly unglamorous uh, Tiberius Caesar. Uh, <laughs> he does not look like a, an, uh, a great godlike man in this film. He looks kind of decrepit. Uh, yes. I don't know what you thought about that, but. No, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting when you finally, because they set up at the very beginning of the, of the movie. You no, know, we, we start, I mean, after the, 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 uh, what, you would, what I guess you would call the prologue of the birth of Christ, which helps us to frame the story and understand that we are going to be, this story takes place between Jesus's birth and Jesus's death. And so we, we, we come with this, the life of Ben-Hur is, is interspersed with that. But we, we, the very first scenes when Masala shows up as the new tribune and he's talking to the old tribune and the conversation is these people are drunk on religion. They can't get it out of their head that there's this one God and there's this sort of constant um, friction between the Jewish people who just are, you know, attached to this one God and the Romans who in the beginning, they talk about Caesar as a divinity, but then um, when, uh, when Pontius Pilate crowns Ben-Hur at the end of the chariot race, right. he says, today you are their God. And it shows you that Ficklins, I thought it was a fascinating aspect of this movie, dealing with the problem of when human beings decide what, who their divinities are and how they fall short so that we see this God and he's this God of Tiberius and he's, mm. you know, nobody we see the god of the roman empire but it's constantly menaced and doesn't know how to purport it doesn't know how to control these jewish people we see the the attempt to make ben hur a god in and of himself and all the while we see what god really looks like with these wonderful punctuations of 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 jesus kind of showing up in this silent peaceful way. I mean, even the music, the, the score, which again, won Oscar, the one Oscar, um, the, the score, which is so huge in Rome mm. and then is so quiet when Jesus comes. It's just, he, it's like that, um, the idea of the God is not in the raging wind. It, it's, yeah. it's a, it's a really, really quite a beautiful way of evoking it. I, I think, um, 
makes it all so fascinating that it's made by William Wyler, who I believe said it took a Jew to make a decent movie about Christianity. Because, of course, yeah. this movie was made as, as a way to blow Cecil B. the Mills movies out of the water. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what other movies did he make? He made Roman Holiday, I believe. Speaking of classic, classic Rome movies, which when I went to Rome, it was the uh, the centennial of Gregory Peck's birth. And in the square in front of the St Spanish steps, they had a big project projector screen and there were all these Romans sitting and watching Roman Holiday <laughs> in the square in front of the Spanish steps. It was quite funny with Italian subtitles. Was, oh, how lovely. Uh, we had something called Mrs. Miniver, which was about um, uh, the about England or London in the, uh, during the Blitz, I believe. Um, yeah, he uh, he was quite a filmmaker, quite a quite a and as a matter of fact, he's he's a filmmaker who uh, people thought to work with, if my recollection is correct. So he, he was an amazing director at getting the best performance out of his actors, and uh, he was uh, it, people thought to work with yeah. him. Yeah, he was. He also had a great, I mean, a great sense of the epic. Uh, another great example. I've seen a couple of his westerns. An old black and white one called The Westerner, which is kind of idiosyncratic. But then, in terms of the epic scale, The Big Country is a western with Gregory Peck, and uh, it's a fairly memorable western in terms of the story. But where it really shines is the score and the photography, which are just some of the most epic western music and epic western photography you'll ever see in a movie uh in terms of these giant landscapes and this the scale of it is is immense uh so i i can see that but uh similarity between those two movies in particular less so with roman holiday uh in in the spirit of the film but um but all classics uh this this film ben-hur won 11 oscars uh which is pretty amazing it was it was unrivaled, I think, until was it Lord of the Rings, which is the one that blew until, it out of the water. Uh, right. I mean, last night I just watched a movie uh, uh, called uh, It Happened One One Night by Frank Capra, and that won five Oscars. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then I was reading my <laughs> notes for this again. I was like, oh, this won 11 Oscars. Uh, <laughs> let's do a little synopsis before we go any further. That's um, right. Something we've been trying to do. I'm sure a lot of people know the this, this story. I'm just going to give broad outline. So basically, the film, it's called Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. We can get into how much we think it is actually A Tale of the Christ or not. But uh, it's framed, at least with the birth and death of Jesus. Um, so that's the time period within which it's set. The main character is this Jewish aristocrat. Judah uh, Ben-Hur. From Nazareth. Judah Ben-Hur. His childhood friend returns to be tribune of Jerusalem and then betrays him. Yeah. And then we follow basically the rest of the film, Ben-Hur going from rags back to riches. It's a revenge tale, but there's also forgiveness bound up in it. There are some right. encounters with Jesus. And so it's also a religious story. Um, there's also a love story, which is easily the worst part of the film. <laughs> uh, and I love, I like love story. So it's not a, Ooh, that's icky type reaction for me, but it's, it's quite boring. But yeah. It's opinion. a sprawling epic that takes us across the ancient world. Um, and I think that's enough said about yeah, the synopsis. Thanks for jumping in and saving me there. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, maybe we can go ahead and take up that question of, is this actually a tale of the Christ? That's something that James was questioning when we were doing our second uh, yeah. Of the film. Well, you know, it's it's right there in the title, and obviously, it's bookended with these incredible, um, you know, moments in the gospel. Uh, but what do you think, Elizabeth? I think it is very much uh, a tale of the Christ. It's how Jesus um, affects the life of these people but particularly this man and and in mm. the intervals with which we see him and so there are moments when when ben hur uh, uh feels completely alone but then something happens and he's always aware that when something happens that there's a hand working beyond the in the supernatural zone so the, i think the first time that we um, encounter the first crossing of uh, Ben Hur and 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 Jesus is when um, 
Ben-Hur has been wrongly accused of attempting to kill a, a Roman official, and Masala has taken, Masala, the Tribune friend that you were discussing before, uh, has taken advantage of this to expropriate his property, imprison Ben-Hur's mother and sister, and send Ben-Hur off to the, the galleys, which galley slaves are supposed to live a year. If you, if you are stuck in the hold of a boat, you wouldn't live very long. This is, this, yeah. is a, this is a punishment to the death. So he's taken off and they're being walked through the desert and we see these people dying in the desert. It's a movie that takes its time, by the way, for all of its fast paced action. We spend some time in the desert with them and we begin to get, you know, thirsty and tired with them. We see the guys dropping left and right and falling into ditches. So they finally get to this place and he's, he's dying of thirst. And because he's so hated, the hatred of Masala follows Ben-Hur to this little town in the middle of nowhere so that when he tries to drink the official knocks the 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 glass out of his the 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 water out of his hand and this this wonderful figure seen from the back comes and gives him to drink and the expressiveness between the yeah. face of the man you don't see the face of the man but the eyes you you understand that ben hur understands that something extraordinary has happened to him and that sense of that sense of being a personal contact with the Christ continues. And, and that is really what Christianity is. It's a personal mm. experience. And that personal experience marks you. So it's interesting that the personal experience that will mark Ben-Hur and ultimately bring him to what we understand at the end is a conversion to Christianity is this encounter through water, right? So it's a really interesting Mm, mm, and this this movement through water. So then he goes in the galley. He nearly die. He nearly dies in the water. He actually rescues someone else from the water. It's it's it has it, it's a beautifully constructed uh, uh, story, which took a lot of work, by the way, because uh, the, the the it was a General Lou Wallace. This book was um, five hundred and fifty pages. So you know, involving the book, you know. Um, Ben Hur goes off and starts an army and it has a lot of other discur this excursions. So they had right. to tighten the story. Mm. But even so, they kept these beautiful markers so that we can follow what's happening over a movie, which is three hours and 40 minutes. So, you know, leaving even Lord of the Rings in the dust. Yeah, in this movie, they, they took out the bit where he actually isn't just planning to lead a rebellion, but actually does so and oh. starts an army and stuff. Uh, and instead added this whole love plot with uh, this <laughs> You character. really want to talk about this love uh, plot, huh? No, well, we don't have to talk about it yet, but 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 I'm just saying I kind of wish they had had the fleshed out his rebellion yeah. afterwards. Give me the rebellion, uh, keep yeah, the love story. Exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. These, these Hollywood films were very careful about their depiction of Christ um, to the point of not showing his face in this case. Um, and uh, this goes, but this goes back to even to the the novel. Um, I have a quote here from Lou Wallace. He was a Civil War general who who wrote this book. Um, he wrote, uh, "The Christian world would not tolerate a novel with Jesus Christ as its hero, and I knew it. He should not be present as an actor in any scene of my creation. The giving of a cup of water to Ben Hur at the well near Nazareth is the only violation of this rule." I would be religiously careful that every word he uttered should be a literal quotation from one of his sainted biographers. So that's wow. the kind of circumspection with which he approached it. And I don't know if he was even a believer when he started writing this book. He uh, he reportedly wrote this book after having a conversation with Robert Ingersoll, who was a famous atheist hmm. lecturer, uh, skeptic of the day, very much uh, somebody who was constantly making assaults upon uh, intellectual assaults upon religion and uh and he wasn't quite satisfied i think he met him on a train he wasn't quite satisfied with their conversation and it inspired him to research more into christianity he wrote this book and reportedly converted had some kind of conversion experience <laughs> while writing the novel um which was immensely popular even before this film was made and and this was not the first film adaptation actually there was a silent film adaptation <laughs> uh earlier um, and then a more recent adaptation in like 2000 something as well, which we won't discuss. But uh, um, it's it's interesting the circumspection with which he treated the, the the character of Jesus, even perhaps not being a believer when he began writing the book. Um, I mean, it just says a lot about the culture now. Now we have films like The Passion of the Christ, 
We have series like The Chosen. Yeah. Uh, right. Show no problem about showing Jesus on screen, you know, uh, which I don't necessarily have a problem with, but it's interesting it is that they were so a different careful about attitude, it yeah. in the past. I, I think you're dealing with something that's apocryphal versus actual scriptural. So when you have the passion of the Christ, which is right. you know, every word out of his mouth is a word that he said, except for like the flashback scenes. Mm. And then in the, right. in, in the, the Zeffirelli version, I mean, these, these are stories that are really taken directly from even Pasolini. It's, it's directly from scripture, but this is the creation of a side story in which Jesus is going to appear. So it kind of makes sense that Jesus is just, uh, on the path that we understand he's on the path of the thing he's going to do like we i think right. it also presumes um it presumes this book because it's written in the end of the 19th century in the mid 19th century when people had a much better handle on scripture so right. people at the time or yeah. you guys watching it you're like oh yeah jesus is gonna he's doing this right now and he's doing that right now all oh, right that's the sermon on the mount like we understand that jesus is just doing his thing and we are watching how a, a, um, a side character was affected by Jesus on the ground in real time. Mm -hmm. But we're not choosing, like, it's not the story of the, you know, person who owned a shop in the corner because you would fall asleep about 30 minutes into right. the movie. But this is instead an epic story of a man who had everything, who lost everything, who has everything, who has to get everything again. So I, I think that's the reason why um, uh, Jesus is he's not we don't want to fixate and 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 drag the story into if you start looking at if you start looking at jesus face and having him talk then then it becomes problematic that like oh back to ben hur it's like that it's like the emperor's new groove where you know, the emperor keeps saying back to me back to me <laughs> so the um the, right. the 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 i i think it's much more evocative to never see his face but what is really beautiful in that same scene where he gives ben her water and then you know in comes the centurion to come and you know hey what are you doing and then jesus stands up jesus is like seven feet tall i mean he's enormous yeah. he's he stands up and we don't see his face, but we see the reactions to people who see him. And I think that's much more beautiful and much more evocative than if they had bothered to hire an actor and say, you know, look yeah. intense, smolder or something. I, I couldn't help but think, think about Galadriel and her, her gaze oh, yeah. <laughs> in that scene. That's you know, a good how, point. Especially her effect on Boromir. Right. Uh, in Lord of the yeah, Rings. Yeah, well, that, that scene in particular is just amazing um, because it begins with uh, Ben-Hur's face in the in the ground, in the mud of like the water that was, was taken away from him. And Jesus comes, his hand enters into the shot and very lightly touches the Ben-Hur's fingertips. And you can see, it's almost like you can see life passing into his hand and it's like he's lifted by the fingertips in this very gentle way. It's it's um so economically shot, you know, in this in this very short sequence with these very slight gestures, but like you said, Elizabeth, just very evocative. And to see it all in Charlton Heston's face um is like I'm able to project myself into that. I'm also able to bring my own relationship with Christ into that because it's not so much being portrayed to me as suggested, you know, my own uh, being on the other end of Christ's gaze. I think that it's kind of a, a poetic thing then that for so much of the film, Ben-Hur ends up kind of ignoring these gospel events you know the 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 sermon on the mount is happening in the background and he's just like yeah i got some business to attend to you can see him in the distance you see all these people that are sitting wrapped and you've got what filming you've got the woman the the girlfriend in the foreground with her you know big open eyes and you can see in the distance deep distance you see ben her you know 
it, it, stubbornly walking away. And then again, it's part of a faith journey. The epic right. part of this is not just the story of what happens to Ben-Hur's fortune and his revenge story, but the epic of Ben-Hur's faith journey, who he starts out when he's the richest man in town, he's very devout, he's a good guy. And then like Job, he's put to the test. Everything is lost. And then the goodness, the inherent goodness that's in him, that sort of that sense of righteous when he saves the man he doesn't need to save, mm -hmm. but because the man is released the, uh, on the in the galley after the famous naval battle scene, and that brings him back into this. In back, brings him back into the world of goodness, and then he still, however, and this is a very Old Testament, New Testament mentality. I mean, think about it. What does he want? He wants the eye for the eye. I've got to go get this yeah, guy. I will right. not have peace until I get my eye for the eye. Whereas at the meantime, there's this new guy who's coming in saying, "Well, how about you know we love." one another and this collision that's going to happen but i did have something i did want to mention about that beautiful uh um, uh observation you had about lifting the thing lifting ben Hur by the fingers what is the picture that they use as the backdrop for the movie when you have the seven oh, minute introduction when you go into the entre act what is their prime picture it's the creation of adam from the sistine chapel ceiling and you can see that that wow. scene is very much that was their way of their that's their homage to michelangelo as as God lifts man from wow. the dirt, from the clay. It's a beautiful, mm. beautiful thing. So that's really well observed. How many hours would you say you've spent looking at that Sistine Chapel uh, fresco? Oh, I think it might now actually fall into a percentage of my life. <laughs> <laughs> As a, as a, been away as a from Rome from art tour long. guide. Yeah, I'm, I've been away from it from, from far too long. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's closed. From, uh, it's driving me a little crazy. But that's all right. I've got to teach it. So I keep looking at pictures. And thank God the pictures. I was looking at their picture of it in the movie. And I was like, oh, oh pre-restoration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I didn't even think about that. You know what I wish? I wish they would put some uh, some bean bags on the floor there, uh, because I really hurt my neck trying to look up at the ceiling. Like they really should have an opportunity to lie oh, down and gee. look at the ceiling. I I did want to finish a thought um, about how the infrequency with which Jesus shows up in this film. It's almost as if you know uh, Ben Hur is just going, going, going. He's got his own ideas, his own plans, and then only ever so often is he startled or interrupted or, or or solicited awoken from his trajectory and i thought you know isn't that so much the experience of, for so many of us i mean obviously we're always trying to live in the daily presence of god and bring our wills more and more into alignment with with his but um but you know so often the only thing i have to go off of is that one time i remember the encounter that gave me hope, you know, and I've forgotten for so long, but now in this crucial moment, it comes back to me. Uh, that's kind of the dynamic that's at work in this film between Jesus and, and Ben-Hur. Yes. And, and there's a contrast to it in the um, figure of Balthazar. I like the way they have the the wise men. So the, the movie opens um, with the the three wise men who are such fabulous casting. I love those three faces yeah. in profile. <laughs> I mean, I feel like Mel Gibson was looking at that when he chose some of his faces for the passion of these <laughs> three incredibly cast. These Get unbelievably fascinating faces. But the really cool thing is that, you know, Balthazar turns out, went home, and then came back. So we have, an, we have apparently an epilogue of the three wise men story. And so Balthazar, the oldest of the wise men, he returns because he's, he saw this child as a babe and he wants to see him as a man. And he is unflagging and unfailing in his faith. And he makes like, he's a constant. He's someone who knew it when the child was born. He knows it. And even as they're witnessing Jesus's uh, crucifixion, his, he, he still is trying to, 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 to keep his faith even in that yeah. dark moment. So he makes a kind of a contrast in the, in the, he, 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 he functions as kind of the chiaro to Charlton Heston school role, right. as it were. He has a great line. I think it's in the Sheik's tent where he's just sort of talking about how how the boy must be of age now. Um, he he perhaps he's looking at a sunset or standing in a doorway, 
and yeah, I, I found that so moving and, you know, from repeat, repeated familiarity with the gospels, with the scriptures, sometimes it's difficult to place yourself there. Sometimes it's too easy to take these, these accounts for granted, but to have another way in through the story of Ben-Hur and to see Jesus sort of uh, secondhand in these very uh, mundane circumstances is like the key for me to this film. You know, that's what's moving. That's what I remember. And I don't think they would have the same power if it weren't for the context that they're given with all of this other action surrounding them. Mm -hmm. The the right. the silent moment. Uh, because, of course, at the end, when, when the roles are reversed and it's Ben-Hur going to Jesus, now carrying his cross uh, on his during his passion, when he comes to him with water, that also is just loaded in a whole new way because of everything that we've seen um, transpire through the the course of this film. Yeah, you mentioned the the kind of the the silence and restraint with which these scenes are treated. I think um, an unfortunate exception to that is the the end the second half of the crucifixion scene yeah. not so much when they're watching him carrying his cross but but when uh when you're cutting back and forth between the crucifixion and the women in the lepers what's it called pit i don't know if they've cave. gone back to the lepers oh, pit not? i the the cave yeah so so th they're making these these women because because uh the girlfriend knows who jesus is but these women don't really and and they're making these uh, the mother and sister. I mean, they're, they're making these kind of like sagacious comments. The mother in particular, as though they like completely understand what's going on. And I I don't know. I didn't I didn't like that. That that kind of took me out of the sure. You know, uh, I think one of the lines is it, it was as if he carried all of our pain on in his cross or something like that. Yeah. You know, it like was, it, was, it was, there was things like very that yeah. on the, on the nose. Yeah. I didn't mind that too much. I liked it very much mm -hmm. that this, that we had the three women. I liked the, so this has been a guy movie for the whole thing, right? It's been like nothing uh -huh. but guys. And then they throw in like the girlfriend every now and then to say, no, 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 there don't worry. There's an XX chromosome around there somewhere. But then, and then mm -hmm. the mother and the daughter like disappear in the first like act and get stuck in the leper column. We don't know where they are, but, right. but to have the moment of realization be told to us by women is very gospel, right? It's the yeah, women sure. who suddenly understand. So I actually appreciate that. I thought more in terms of, I mean, yes, I noticed like, wow, you you really picked that up fast, sister. But the, <laughs> right. But but the idea of like the apostle to the apostles, the idea of these women who these three, there are three women together and they realize right. what has happened and they are going to, I liked that a lot. I thought that was a beautiful way of taking the biblical women and, and, and using it in the film. And it, and for me, like I said, it kept it from, I mean, it, the whole movie's been like a guy movie for the whole movie. Right. I mean, it gave me a moment like, okay, you didn't forget about us after all. We get the most important part. We get to explain who he was. Sure. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I guess, I guess I think it could have been handled uh, more more subtly, but yeah, I think the, the the part that it's these three women, I think, yeah, that's good. Um, so what do we think about this, uh, this whole, uh, this whole girlfriend, uh, <laughs> subplot? I mean, do you find it as pointless as James and I did? No, I find, it seems like really shoved in, in a very strange way because- The scenes are long. They are long. <laughs> Yeah, what that that's like if they were almost as if they were planning a musical. Like they're in that in that little terrace room where, uh, he's, right. you know, if if you were a bride, if if I were, if I were not a bride, if you right. were, were not a bride, I would kiss. You. I mean, that sounds like it should be like like if you were not a bride, I <laughs> if I were not a bride, anyway, you know that kind of thing. Right. It's, I felt like like someone's like tuning up for a musical. I I I have a really. Um, funny feeling about why they emphasize this girlfriend figure so much. I think it has a lot to do with that. It's to counteract the Masala uh, Judah Ben-Hur opening scene, because that opening scene, the first time that they meet, is really jarring. It's like, what? <laughs> you don't? Because their relationship is very... Right. 
ambiguous and and Gore Vidal made a big point of you know saying well I threw in all these homosexual overtones and apparently in in the first script the, the, much of his script was um was removed so um so he was the I, I first, spec- first script writer right so yes the the the, 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 the um the 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 script went through five writers and wow. one of the very first people to come in and work on it was Gore Vidal, who was kind of an in thing in script writing. He was trying to set up because he sees the movie, and I, I don't like Gore Vidal very much. So perhaps there will be an acerbic comment. I did William F. Buckley. As far as I know, the only sort of pro or crypto Nazi I can think of is yourself. Failing that, I would only say that we can't have. Now listen, you the right of the Stop calling me a crypto Nazi. Let's stop calling names. Face, and you stay plastered. Just- and I and neither did Charlton Heston. Um, so I, I just I, I apologize in advance, you Gorbit all fans. I I just he does nothing for me. But he 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 was he was unable to understand apparently uh, how to build up this antagonism between Charlton Heston or between Judah Ben Hur and Masala, and he didn't. Uh, the way he thought of resolving the problem, how could they have this hatred that ends in this death match in the arena? How in the circus, how could that happen? And because he can't, I mean, obviously he's not going to be able to think in terms of like Jesus and redemptive anything, because it's clear that's not on his, not on his mm-hmm. agenda. And because the idea that people can really truly fall out because their visions of the world are different, he falls in the, in the, in the, into the, let's make them spurned lovers. And right. so let's imply that there was something that happened when they were young. And then Masala is going to pick it up again. And, and, and even though, um, even though Charlton Heston, there's a famous, uh, there's a famous uh, debate between the two or an argument that takes place. It's published where Gore Vidal says that he inserted all of the homosexual overtones and Charlton Heston said, no, they didn't. And then it turns wow. into like silly. I mean, if they, had, if they were, if there had been Twitter back then, it would have been, real <laughs> but anyway, the, um, the point is that uh, I think uh, that scene is very disconcerting. I mean, it's very odd, especially right. with, the 20, with, with the 2020 sensitivity we have to scenes like that. But already, I think, in, in 1959, it was totally a scene that was a little right. spinta. It's a little I, uncomfortable. I and they, oh, you didn't? And the way, they, they, the way they, they link arms when they drink wine, which is it's like a marriage really toast. intense. Yeah. And well, they, yeah, but they, I, I take that their as like their faces a are this man. far apart and they gaze Wait, well, like, into each other. Oh my lord! No. No. Yeah. Well, so on my first viewing, I I was with Thomas. You know, I didn't I didn't really pick up on that too much. Um, but then when he, once he had mentioned this bit about Gore Vidal to me, I, yeah, I on the second mention. viewing, I was like, oh my gosh, this is all over the place. So I take it as like a credit to myself that I was able to <laughs> sort of disassociate yeah. from my cultural milieu and like be able to just appreciate these two guys having an intense friendship that's, I mean, you know, like, so Brides Had Revisited, for instance, is like one of my favorite novels. And then the series with, uh, with, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Jeremy Irons is just like amazing. Um, so, so, you know, I'm already inclined to just be like accepting of like a really intense male friendship on screen, but when I watched it the second time, I was like, whoa, this is this is intense. And the javelin throwing is like if I'm if I'm coming at it with this sort of like mindset, then that's very suggestive. Suge- suggest- Dang it. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Well, you know, it's OK. I like, uh, don't feel I did not think about the javelin throwing. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up, Elizabeth, with the CCC cartoon version of Ben-Hur. I think I only saw this movie or part of it once when I was younger. Uh, The the CCC was like a Catholic. I don't even know what it stands for, but it it was like this Catholic. They would make like a Fatima cartoon and stuff. This was stuff we had on VHS when I was a kid. Beauty in battle. What's wrong, Judah? Jealous? And uh, they, they, I always thought that the, the wrist handshake, like clasp thing was like super cool and super manly. I just don't want that ruined for me. No, basically. it is. It's still no, cool. It's, but it's like, not the when they, when they, it's not the handshake. It's the drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Because then it's 
the music swells, they're gazing into each other's eyes, and then it fades and it cuts to the image of the two like uh, javelins in the beam together. And it it's did? like, I yes, know. yes. Hmm. So, you know, it's like, whatever. I, I My middle name is not subtext. I, I was reading about that. I was, I was hunting this down because I first I was, I was like, that can't be right. I must be reading this wrong. There must be something wrong with me. I started out with, there must be something wrong with me. And then I started reading. It turns out that it's a very famous debate between the two. But then I read, I, I followed it to the, to, to the end. And it turns out that um, uh, Stephen Boyd, who plays Masala, and William Wyler were both coached by Gore Vidal that this would be a way to create the intensity. But right. Charlton Heston would have nothing to do with it. So apparently the <laughs> indication was they, they took out the script. So there's nothing in the script like insofar as the words they say to each other, mm-hmm. no problem. Mm-hmm. It's the visuals that's the that's the issue. And then um, and then uh, in the note, uh, when William Wyler kind of gave it the okay, it was all right, fine, but don't tell Chuck or he'll freak out. <laughs> so um, so 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 I think so. Yeah, so well, the point I'm so the point I'm trying to make is this is something they did in Lord of the Rings too, by the way. But you it it. it it, it, it doesn't it's not evident but when right. they were coaching sam and frodo because the actors don't really understand a strong male friendship that way the way that they explained it to them is like imagine you guys are lovers and that was right. the, that was what they were told oh, to I do never heard that. Wow. They, they don't i mean they don't act like that but that was how they evoked that yeah. intense allegiance to each other and i think that also works very effectively also because that stephen boyd is very very pretty and so but i mean those long gazes were like the tears are welling up in in, mm-hmm. in his eye and, and like there's oh no there, there were a few and then masala kind of looks down towards his mouth and you're like Ooh, yeah. what is going on here yeah. so and, that's and why also... i think they emphasize the girlfriend yeah, Masala also has this weird, uh, like, Drusus is the name. This guy who's just always with him through the entire film. Um, He's like the page boy or something. Yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> yeah, this is actually something that comes up a lot, unfortunately. I mean, uh, the, in the Tolkien biopic, I have to give Joseph Pierce credit because he wrote this this article before the Tolkien biopic came out saying, you know what, I'm afraid... They're going to try to make Tolkien gay or something because because two of the writers who wrote the movie had made gay movies in the past. And and I was like, dang it, Joseph Pierce, like, why? like you don't you've never even seen the movie like this is like totally prejudiced of you. And then I watched the movie and it was fine. But then I read afterwards that they uh, they had, in fact, like one of the writers was convinced that Tolkien's friend, I forget which friend in school had been in love with him. And uh, had written it that way. Yeah. And then the director actually saved it by telling, saying, you know what? We can't know this for sure. So he told the actor, play it ambiguous. Play it so that it could be interpreted either way. Sure. But, uh, well, you know, anyway, the same thing yeah. is said about St. John Henry Newman um, and one of his closest friends. St. John the Evangelist, St. John Henry Newman, Jonathan and David. Yeah. So, you know. It, it is really speaks to the crisis in understanding male friendship, which, of course, is follows hard on it. Logically, it makes sense in a period when there's a crisis in what masculinity is when you know being a man is toxic. I mean, what do you what how are you going to understand things? So the I think the I, I think there are different levels and nuances to relationships and in the certain the Americanata aspect of the way that we look at things today is it's really, it's black or white, right? So surprisingly in a world where we apparently have 25,000 different genders, um, the idea that there can be nuances right. of a kind of affection for right. male affection and a male affection that evolves. So you, if you have a friend when you were young who was in love with you, it just it doesn't mean that you are so you ascribe to this particular lifestyle. I live this all the time with you know Michelangelo, gay, not gay. I mean, I, I can tell you one thing that I'm pretty sure Michelangelo didn't 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 think about was like his lifestyle in terms of his sexuality. He right. didn't define right. himself by his sexuality. Sexuality. And that is the ultimate confusion that we can see a man like Gore Vidal really trying to introduce into cinema and this idea of this identity. It, 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 that's that's what motivates you. That's what makes you that's what makes you tick. Whereas right. um, I think these are I think at the end of the day, 
Um, you have these two, uh, uh, I, I, you see him in Masala, a man who was friends. He's very proud of himself that he was friends with Jews. And, oh yeah, I lived here and I had this friend, but he always naturally assumed to power, right? He starts talking about his father and the previous, in the Tribune, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know about your father. He assumes power. He's like, of course you're going to do what I say. Because when they were kids, yeah. this never came up. But now, well, you know, Judah, you're a friend of mine. You're welcome here. We're going to have parties. But you do know that you're my subject and you're going right. to do what I want. And when he finds a man who has principle, which is not something that he finds in Rome, he he doesn't know how to react to it when it's his friend. And he you know clearly has a mistaken concept of what friendship is. It, it all falls apart. I, I don't yeah. even think they needed the sexuality to add to it. But I think it already it's a very, in, very interesting indication that our ability to understand relationships was already deteriorating in 1959. Right. Yeah, and especially in that community, right? In the entertainment industry, even at that time, it was already the, the you know, the, the sexual ethical mores were already quite dislodged. So... Indeed. Um, so uh, one thing I think this movie does really well is it, it shows you kind of the Jewish patriotism, but also is totally convincing as to the Roman empire being really awesome and like how awesome it would be to be Roman, mm -hmm. you know, especially the scenes in Rome itself. It just made me want to be a Roman. You know, <laughs> I was like, what an awesome thing to be a citizen of Rome, uh, in the, in the, in the capital. Uh, and, and also, you know, the fact that, you know, this, this, this consul could adopt this slave, which I think is something that could have happened, you know, in Rome, just just a lot about his character is very interesting. It, it's very telling. It, you get a lot about Roman culture and the Roman right. ethos just from his character. The idea that he wants to commit suicide, his kind of cynicism about the Roman gods. I love the line when he tells the slave, the galley slaves, you know, if we lose this battle, you're all going to die. So uh, he says, you are condemned men. We keep you alive to serve this ship. So row well and live. Yes. I love I love that because it's so motivational in a positive way. <laughs> Bizarrely, uh, row well and live. He doesn't say row well or you're gonna die. I mean, obviously that's the implication, but row well and live is a very like aspirational, <laughs> right thing to say. It almost it meets them where they're at. Like, look, you're condemned, but we have there's a place for you even now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you get a sense of why the Romans were such effective conquerors, maybe right, finding right. a place for all these different uh, stratas of society. I don't know. The chaining them in before they ram the boat so they'll all drown did not strike me as the nicest thing. I He's, he's a really, I, he was one of the very special pieces of casting for William Wyler. Um, William Wyler went to Jack Hawkins, who had just done another epic, I think, um, Bridge over the River Kwai or something, mm. and he didn't want to do another epic movie. He didn't. He wasn't in the mood. But he, Jack uh, William Wyler, convinced him to do this movie, and I, I see why um, there was such insistence that that particular character I don't think could have been played by many people because he's a hard man, and he's in many ways he is the embodiment of Roman cruelty. He gets in the mm. boat and he does this whole exercise of making the men, you know, do the different different types of rowing, right. and he's watching them pitilessly as they fall right. apart. And what he's really trying to do is break. He's doing all of this to break that one guy who has the nerve to look him in the eye. And then when then when he doesn't break. He, because he's had, so he asks him, and he's been on the on the galley for three years. And as I said earlier, you would usually die within a year. So he's there's something he's 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 bothered by this man who is refusing to do what Roman slaves are supposed to do and up and die within the year. Wow. And then they have this incredible encounter when he has you know Ben Hur brought to him, and he says, "Oh, how does, it, how does the line go?" He says, uh, "You know." this this god of yours that you're so attached to this and and, and then ben her asks him a question along the lines of how did you lose your faith right and that 
and and then they don't talk until that it, but something happens in in that character and the character at the last minute has been her unchained from the gang so if the if if the boat drown if the boat goes down there's a chance that he'll live and then ultimately it it's a beautiful and then he's so understanding about the what heart I don't get is he gives you know Ben her everything and Ben is like yeah thanks um so I'm going to be going to Jerusalem I don't think I'm coming back so yeah thanks <laughs> Right. It, it was like, oh, all right, okay. Yeah. So he pours all this affection on him, and then, and then Ben Hur just throws it away. I mean, that was the part I was a little like. James and I were quite annoyed uh, by the girlfriend whose name I cannot remember. Esther. <laughs> Esther. Esther's decision to lie to Ben Hur. She doesn't. Not only she, does she not tell him, she like goes out of her way to lie to him about his mother and sister's whereabouts yeah we we found the whole scene where they're asking her to lie where they show up for no reason and then ask her to lie <laughs> really obnoxious i it's a shame because that terrace would have made a great set for a better love story uh than this this film gave us yes this um, was that was not that was not the who. high point of the movie but charlton heston really was he's a very 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 i i, I was very struck at how this this hugely big powerful man but yeah, he's always like he's he's always giving that kind of side take me from the yeah. side smolder look but he could be this 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 intensity he's able to 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 bring to the screen it was I, yeah. it, it, you really I, I feel like i was watching the first superstar in the sense that there are very few actors who can stand up to that kind of epic 15,000 extras, huge special effects, colossal sets. Yeah. There are very, very, very few. Like Tom Cruise can do it in apparently any circumstance. But, you know, <laughs> when you took Orlando Bloom out of being a side character yeah. in Lord of the Rings or a side character in Pirates of the Caribbean and you gave him a movie on his own, you're like, oh, oh. yeah. Mm -hmm. No yeah, offense, he's a lovely man, but he can't carry the he can't sure. carry the movie. And you see them try out these actors who they want to, but it's a rare quality. And Charlton Heston completely had it. I would love to know how they learned the art of chariot driving and building in this day and age. Like who's 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 kept up that craft <laughs> to uh, to like teach them how to train the horses properly for team you know i guess maybe it's not that different from like a wagon or something <laughs> i don't know it is well that's that's the interesting thing about the whole about the whole so the um second unit which is res responsible for the chariot race was led by andrew morton who had worked on the chariot who had worked on the 1925 version of ben-hur so he oh. already had experience of seeing kind of trying to make this trying to make this thing happen although they were going to do it i mean this is a 15 million dollar movie in 15 million dollars yeah. in 1959 it's a right. crazy 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 amount of money and the other person who was involved was a man named yannick yannick canute is his name and yannick canute was the other assistant with the second unit he was the assistant director of the second unit yannick canute is the man who did the stunts he was the stunt director in the Stage movie Coach. stagecoach yep and That's right. Yannicka Canute, yeah, 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 yeah. Those movies, yeah. those back when they did those, I watched the documentary. Yannicka Canute. Back in the day, they they would they would do these very complicated scenes with teams of horses. So they weren't that far away from using huh. horses. So in, and then they brought in they brought in a great handler of the horses. It was a man named Glenn Randall who came in to do the training. And then uh, for this is this is a scene that took five months to film. It took months from the minute that Stephen Boyd and uh, uh, Charlton Heston showed up on set. Wow. They had to start learning. And apparently Charlton Heston did like three hours a day of learning and throwing javelins. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, he and there, several skills. There's a there's a funny story where um uh the I forget who the name of the true the person who was training them. Um Charlton Heston apparently already was very like tough and he had very they say very strong shoulder muscles and he had a lot of calluses on his hands. So he didn't have trouble 
he learned very quickly how to manage to do these things with the horses. But poor Stephen Boyd, who you know <laughs> obviously had been manscaped to within an inch of his life, he kept ripping oh, his man. hands apart, and they so they they had to stop filming every now and then to let his hands heal. He had a much harder time with it, so they had to go through this whole training. Then they designed a, a separate track. So all the while they're building the giant, you know stadium there they had a second dirt track where they were practicing all the time and they brought wow. in 82 horses 82 horses from yugoslavia then and this this trainer just turned them into nine teams of of horses it, it's that 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 scene is just i i i feel like it's 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 kind of it's like the sistine chapel of 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 cinema it's of just it's so yeah so completely new and the things and you feel it's the same feeling I always get on Lord of the Rings when they were undertaking this project as a team and they didn't know as they were starting it exactly how some of these tricks these things were going to work out but they all got together as a team they all went to New Zealand and they all and you can feel how the team is working together like how they're so excited about what they're doing I feel that about some like I feel that in them and Monsters, Inc., uh, I feel that in, in The Lord of the Rings. And I feel that in this movie, when you you, you kind of wish you could have been part of that team because you yeah. know, you know that every day with all of the difficulties, broken cameras, like $100,000 lenses damaged, uh, the potential of, of, of death. I mean, uh, uh, this, the famous stunt of uh, Ben-Hur falling out of the, you know, when he hits, the, he, go, he oh jumps gosh. over the he chariot. He flips out of the chariot. It was, there were only two stunts that he didn't do, that Charlton Heston didn't do. And the person who did the stunt of the jumping chariot was the son of Yannicka Knut, Joe. Wow. And when Joe did that that stunt, um, he was going too fast because he was 22 year old and really excited. He's going too <laughs> fast. And it hit the, it was a log to make that jump. There was a little log embedded in the ground and he was physically he, that that scene when you see someone physically thrown out of the carriage that yeah. was he that was actually the boy was thrown out of the carriage he managed to hold on to the horses a la stagecoach and then um he they stopped it immediately and they took him into the infirmary and he had a cut on his chin he got his stitches and he came right back out and wow. finished, finished it. Oh. As everybody apparently the story is very the story is told beautifully by Andrew by Andrew Martin and so um and so this was this the kind of things they did Stephen Boyd actually did the scene of being dropped underneath the carriage um the first Crazy. version they tried to do it with a dummy but the dummy looked like it was a dummy <laughs> The other guys you see falling out of the carriages, they are dummies and they kind of look it right. But the guy who falls under the carriage when it's Stephen Boyd is actually Stephen Boyd. He's protected by harnesses. Now, and now you're he's ta- still are you could talking have died. only. Are you only talking about this the, the close up shot where he's hanging on but not being trampled, and not the scenes where he's actually being trampled? I'm assuming those are a dummy, but the one where he's hanging. He's hanging exactly. He's yeah. hanging underneath the chariot. So I mean, yeah. this is this is they're they're doing things in um, in the world of stunts that haven't really been done. It, it's a it's still amazing to see, and also all of the storytelling that's able to be accomplished in the midst of all of it too, right? Because it's not just thrilling, you know, stunts, but there's actually you know the drama of the race unfolding and these discrete moments of tension and conflict, and uh, you know, it's like. It's it's like a movie in its own right. Um, it, it feels like a very complete experience from beginning to end. Sure. And uh, and frankly, especially because they take so much time, I think, with introducing the track. That's and right. The horses ride around. Yeah, and... everything's delightful. The music, the 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 stadium filled with people, the colors. You know that that every charioteer has their own sort of uh, uh, regalia from their their country of origin. Um, you know, it made me. It made me think of Star Wars Episode One, uh, uh, pod racing. Uh, I, I imagine that George Lucas had to have been operating with with this movie in mind, because basically what we get in Star Wars Episode One is just space chariots doing the exact same thing, um, down right. to Anakin's pod racer. Pod uh, pod racer has the same colors that Ben Hur has on his chariot. 
but even for the making of the of the Star Wars, the first the first three, I, I, the new number numerical system irritates me beyond belief. But right, the right, but right. even even with the making the the, the movie Ben Hur is part of what inspired George Lucas, and especially in the in the use of the um, especially in the use of uh, dramatic music. Um, and also in this kind of very sort of these grand processions, like how to create these very grand scenes, yeah. which he does when you see the evil empire coming in. Um, and, uh, and, and, and interestingly though, during the actual, um, during the actual race, there is no music. All you hear is we hear the music of the coming in, right. but once the race right. starts, there's no music. All That's you hear true. is that, like, that the, 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 the 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 hoofs on the ground the oh. chariots it's really i mean you're no distractions you're in that race yeah the sound design is incredible the second time we watched it together thomas turned down the volume during the chariot race and i was so annoyed at him i didn't say anything but i'm saying it now because you the sound design to turn it back the up. sound design is annoyed. just incredible like the thumping of the and then the grinding into the wood and and uh yeah the squeals like ah oh my gosh when people are left on the track and you know that these these <laughs> right. these horses are coming back right. around you better hurry and get out of the way yeah. oh my gosh i'm getting excited just thinking about it it's a myth correct that somebody died during the filming of the chariot no, race nobody that, that, died that is the amazing thing yeah. no not even a horse not even a horse when right. they used to do um when they used to do the father yannicka used to do uh horse stunts and he developed a kind of horse stunt in which the horse almost always died so I mean, in the space of what stagecoach is what thirty nine, and this is yeah. fifty nine. So obviously, some some animal rights had kicked in in that period. So <laughs> not only that, eighty two horses came and eighty two horses left, wow. and outside of injuries, nobody died. And That's and amazing. Zimbalist, who oh you know you know the only person who died, the producer, Sam Zimbalist died during on set of a heart attack. Whoa. The only wow. person, and that is William Wyatt, I had to take on the job of being the producer, but he was the only one. <laughs> it's so awful. This wow. movie, oh. this movie, Sam Zimbalist, he tells, he tells um, Andrew Martin, like, you can do whatever you want for this scene. The only thing is nothing under any circumstances can happen to Charles and Heston or Stephen Boyd. So they got all this trouble and they say everybody, everybody lives and then Sam Zimbalist dies. That, that makes me, and he never got to see it. He never got to see his movie win all those Oscars. I don't know. That's. Is, um, is there a book that you read about this uh, where you have this encyclopedic knowledge of the, <laughs> the people involved in the film? There are books, there are books written on it, but mostly I was reading a lot about the, um, I was really interested in the photography of it, like the the kinds of, I was interested in this new kind of photography and the way they have to use color and light. So they're using these, so I was reading a lot of those and then from those I would kind of follow another article or follow something else. And I found Andrew Morton's, mm -hmm. Martin's own description of what happened. So I thought that was kind of, to hear him talking was about he in the it. DP? He's he's his second unit. He's the guy oh, who does the he's it. he's in, he is the man who did the chariot race. He is the guy. It goes under the heading of William Wyler. William Wyler showed up on the set for the procession scenes and then never came back. It was one hundred percent Andrew Martin who did that scene. That with the help wow. of this you know, kind of and um no, I just found it really um uh, I, I, the, the stuff I liked is a, is a little nerdy, but um, it has to do with using these. So there were basically six of these 65 millimeter cameras in the world, and five of them were in Rome being used by um, by Aunt William Wyler. And three were wow. given for the chariot wow. scene, and two were for other scenes. And the problem with this... It, the problem with this is it's, it's super high definition. And so they had to worry all the time about, that's why they're wearing such thick makeup because mm. the, the, it will oh, bring up any, okay. so anything that's on your face, it'll show. And they also had to be super careful with color contrast. And it also has difficulty focusing, this particular technique has difficulty focusing on two people at once. So if you had two people and they needed to be equal in the scene, um, you had to you had to dress the other one in a contrasting color and light them differently. I mean, it's just it's mm. it's so. I mean, beyond the, the the technical difficulties of getting the horses and building the set and everything else, but the 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 work on the part of those cinematographers to get the light always. They're filming from six thirty in the morning till five thirty in the evening, and the light changes all day long, and so they have to constantly be changing the way the light is is put on the set and the way the makeup and the. It's just yeah. I. I I, I, 
I, I hats off. It just, it's, it's, it's the beginning of, and I love these big, I love big, huge, expensive movies. Matter of fact, people ask me what kind of movies do you like? I say, I like them expensive. I don't like cheap <laughs> movies. I like movies that look like you have spent so much money on them. And this is the beginning of the expensive movie. And in my opinion, that it shows it. And I'm very pleased that the Vatican put something that's such an Americanata. They usually don't like our, yeah. they don't like our exuberance where it's like we're, we're, we're adolescents. We get overexcited. Well, it's the only Hollywood film on the religion section. Mm. So uh, Liz, thank you so much for coming on the show to talk uh, about this film with us. It was really fun. Well, thank you. This was really fun. I, I actually liked, um, I liked going back and looking at that movie and I realized it, it helped me understand a lot about uh, what I like visually. It was very, um, it, it was a, it was a great opportunity to remember why I think I always feel like I have to be, I'm always a little defensive about the fact that you know, I watch Endgame over and over and over again. <laughs> 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 I, I I realize what what I really I enjoy that that kind of being drawn into it and imagine yeah. how much better it is how much better it is when you're drawn into this great story and the story is uplifting and mm. brings you closer to Christ. So what more can I Amen. ask for? So our next film we discuss will be our first Russian production and our first Asian production. Actually, it was a joint Japanese Soviet production. On the values section of the Vatican film list from 1975, Akira Kurosawa's Dersu Uzala, based on the memoirs of the Russian explorer Vladimir Arseniev. It's a very delightful, heartwarming film. Kind of an interesting pick for the Vatican film list uh, from this best-known uh, Japanese director in the West. Mm -hmm.